In this video, we're going to look at the use of the open source program Meshroom to create a 3D model from a series of photographs. So we'll talk about the user interface and adding images. Then we'll talk about processing settings and editing the node setup before moving on to building the sparse cloud, then building the mesh or the 3D model itself. We'll look at ways to improve the mesh before texturing the model and finally uh, locating the 3D model and associated texture files on your hard drive. So let's go ahead and begin by looking at Meshroom's user interface. We have two windows up here where we'll drop and preview the images that we'll use to compute our 3D model. The 3D viewer space over here on the right hand side will allow us to actually preview results of the photogrammetry process at various stages. And then finally, our graph editor provides a node-based method for interacting with the various steps used in the photogrammetry process. So this includes things like lining up and matching your images, creating the actual structure from motion, moving through mesh creation, and eventually texturing the model. We'll go ahead and worry about various settings in a moment. Let's go ahead and start by adding a series of images. And these 26 images can be downloaded in this video's description. And they're a well from the historic site of Kingsley Plantation located north of Jacksonville, Florida. So these look pretty good, but before we click start or start changing any settings, we always want to make sure to save our project. Save it to its own Meshroom folder within my larger folder, and I'll just call this Kingsley Well in this case, because that's what it is. We can approach this in two ways. We can just hit start, and what that will do is start working through all of these different steps until we get to the very end and we have our, our, our completed model with a texture created. But what I'd like to do before we start that is go ahead and explore what each of these are going to do. And now some of these are pretty basic. The camera in it, the node here, is basically going to be bringing in our cameras, our feature extraction, and we can expand this by clicking on advanced attributes. And we can see a few of these other settings here. What we want to do here is we want to untick force CPU extraction. What that's going to do for me on this computer, because I have a graphics processing unit, a graphics card, it's going to actually free this up a bit. It may only be a marginal improvement, and it may not work on your machine if you don't have a graphics card, but it basically gives us a, a slightly better feature extraction experience. We can go ahead and for the most part leave image matching alone. These defaults are going to be good and this is of course just where the program will go through these different images and find points in common between images and match them up. Feature matching is then going to be part of an intermediate step before the structure from motion node which is going to actually construct a point cloud representing this feature in 3D space. So for feature matching, we do want to go ahead and enable uh, guided matching. So we'll just click on guided matching here. And this actually takes a little longer than leaving this unchecked, but it'll often produce a much better reconstruction. Structure from motion, there are different things here we could uh, check. As you can see, there are a lot of different uh, aspects here. One of the ones that if you end up getting bad feature reconstruction, in other words, if your 3D model looks bad, one of the things you could click here would be the SIFT, the AKAZE, and um, you would want to do this in structure from motion, feature matching, and you can see this is here as well, and then of course feature extraction. But we're going to go ahead and leave this extra one unchecked for now particularly with this set of photos, this should work. But there are, of course, a lot of different settings here that you can choose from, and a quick internet search would actually let you understand what all of these different ones are, are related to. After structure from motion, prepare dense scene. This is going to basically take the point cloud, in this case a sparse point cloud created during the structure from motion node, and turn it into a dense point cloud. Again, here we, we basically will leave this alone. We want to come into depth map, and here there actually is something we may want to change. For instance, if we want to speed up the process, as you'll see as you're processing these models, depth map is always going to be the node that takes the longest to run. And so you could change the SGM 
number neighbor, so number of neighbor cameras setting here. You could take this down to five. You would never want to go below three, but five basically will speed this up two times, right? So it's it's using half as many neighboring cameras for the depth maps. And depth maps are of course going to become very useful when you're building your meshes. Next we can go ahead and check on depth map filter, leave all of these defaults, go into meshing, and we can scroll around here and see minimum observations angle for structure from motion space estimation. We'll leave this at 10 for now, but I'm gonna come back in a few moments and we're going to look at this. Generally, you'll want to change this amount because instead of constructing everything in all of the photos, this setting will allow you to sort of restrict your final 3D model to the focus of your photos. Next would be mesh filtering. And we wanna go ahead and enable keep only the largest mesh. Now there is a node here that I like to add based on a number of other researchers who have explored this called the mesh resampling. It's not here by default, so if you right click beneath here and type in mesh resampling, we can click on this and we've now added this. Another click and drag, we can reposition it. This would be similar to the decimation or mesh decimate function. If you want to know about the difference between these, you're welcome to sort of search the um, Meshroom website or, or Google this to, to see the difference. But basically what these do is they help you produce a, a more lightweight model. Now, of course, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to connect this in here. So if you click on this connective string between these two nodes, right click and click remove, you can then connect this by dragging out connections basically clicking and dragging out. And then when you hover over an input or an output, this will reconnect. And so now we're ready to go ahead and start processing this. Again, you might as well go ahead and save it. It never hurts. And what I like to do actually is I like to right click and instead of processing it all at once, I like to process it in, in sort of chunks. So I'm gonna to get to the structure from motion, which is gonna produce a sparse point cloud. And once this is finished, we'll go ahead and analyze the results. So I'm gonna click Compute, and now you can see up here the Start button has been grayed out. The Stop button is now accessible, and we can see this basically moving through. It's already gone through the Camera Init node. It's into the Feature Extraction node, and up here at the top we can sort of see an overall progress bar, and then this is moving through Feature Matching. And once it's done here, it'll go into structure from motion, and then we'll have our sparse point cloud. So I'll pause the video and come back when this is complete. Okay, now that this is completed, we can go ahead and we can preview this quickly over in the 3D viewer. It will have automatically been loaded. And we can see here, it's not a beautiful point cloud. It's not a lot of points. They're very blotchy, but that's fine. This is generally the shape we're looking for. So what I then like to do is I like to take this over to the meshing function, right click on it, and then compute this. And of course, as I said before, the meshing function here is one we'll actually change one of the attributes for, particularly this min observations angle for structure for motion or SFM, space estimation. Let's go ahead and leave it at 10 for now and look at the results. So I'll right click and select compute and then I'll pause the video and come back when this is complete. All right, so we finished now going all the way through the meshing node. That last bit of processing took me about 10 to 12 minutes or so, so a little bit of time. Obviously up here in our 3D viewer, we still have that sparse point cloud, but if we wanna go ahead and look at the mesh, we can double click this node and you'll see this will start to load and when it's finished, we'll actually have our 3D mesh. We can go ahead and turn off. We can either just hide the sparse point cloud or we can delete it altogether. And now we can see we have a pretty nice model here. It looks like it's kind of lined up okay. Maybe not great, but we can always fix that in post-processing of Blender or something else. The next thing I want to talk about before we move on and create the texture is this setting here, the min observation angle for SFM space estimation. As you can see here, there's a whole bunch of the landscape around the well that's also being reconstructed. And so we can get rid of that by changing this value. And I'm just gonna go ahead, because I've experimented with this a little bit, I'm gonna go ahead and put 60 in here. 
but typically people would enter 20 or 40 and often get good results. So what I'm going to do here is right click and compute just the meshing node again. Okay, that's completed. And so if we double click on the meshing node, give it a moment to load, we'll see that this model looks pretty different. In fact, it's pretty much locked it just to the area around the, the well. We do have some holes in here. We probably want to fiddle with this a little bit. Maybe drop this down to 40 or 50. But either way, we can see how this setting alone acts as sort of a default bounding box for us to use. Now next, we want to go ahead and as we get ready to texture the model, there's some changes we want to make here as well. I would texture size, drop this down to 4096. You can keep it higher, but it's going to take longer to process. But then also unwrap method, change this to LSCM. What this will do is create one texture map for the entire model instead of the default or basic selection, which will go ahead and create many different uh, textures. So of course now we can right click on texturing and click compute. And again, I'll pause this so we can go ahead and preview the textured model by double clicking on the texturing node. And of course, it's going to look a little odd. We want to go ahead and turn off the mesh itself. And we can see we now have a pretty nifty model of this well. Now, the final aspect to look for here is where the model and textures have been saved. So we can right click on the texturing node and choose open folder. And then we'll see here an OBJ file, which in this case is almost 32 meg, an MTL, which is a materials file, and then a PNG. And this 20 megabyte file is our texture. You can see it's a bit of an odd looking uh, picture, but this is what gives our 3D model uh, its texture. And then of course with this we could go ahead and explore this, uh, these three files in another piece of software like Blender. We could clean up the mesh and continue to do uh, other things. And so here you can see a final version of this well processed and with some basic modifications to the mesh and so forth in Blender. And of course, uh, slightly different settings to close those holes in the meshing node in Meshroom. So that's it. This is how you create a really nice looking model from a series of photos using the open source software Meshroom.